A passage plan, or voyage plan, is a detailed, systematic, and comprehensive plan prepared to ensure the safe navigation of a vessel from birth to birth. It covers every stage of the voyage, from departure, through coastal and ocean passages, up to the final approach and berthing at the destination port. Its purpose is essential to promote safety of navigation, compliance with regulations, and efficient voyage management. The responsible officer in charge of making the passage plan is the master, but on most merchant vessels, the preparation is normally delegated to the second officer. The master must review and improve the plan before departure. Today's video covers the four stages of passage planning, appraisal, planning, execution, and monitoring. The appraisal stage is the foundation of the entire passage plan. At this stage, the navigator collects, reviews, and evaluates all relevant information needed for the intended voyage, identifying navigational hazards and other factors that may affect the ship's safety. We can refer to the Bridge Team Management Manual or to the passage planning guidelines provided on board for detailed procedures. However, it is important to check the company's SMS for any specific instructions or additional guidelines regarding the preparation of a passage plan. If we take a look at the Bridge Team Management Manual Table of Contents, we can see that Chapter 2 lists the sources of information used in the appraisal stage, which can be found on page 9. It is stated that such appraisal should be made by considering information from a variety of sources, including, but not limited to, the following. Not all of these sources will be necessary for every passage or voyage, but this list serves as a comprehensive checklist to ensure that all essential information is considered before planning the route. Let's have a brief discussion on the following sources of information listed, starting from the chart catalog. This publication lists all available navigational charts and their limits, scales, and additions. It helps the navigator select the correct charts for the entire voyage. Second is the navigational charts. These are the primary tools for planning and conducting navigation. They show coastlines, depths, dangers, aids to navigation, and other essential details. Third, ocean passages for the world. A publication provided recommended ocean routes, distances, and seasonal weather patterns for long ocean passages. Fourth is the routing charts or pilot charts. These show average meteorological and oceanographic conditions such as prevailing winds, currents, and storm tracks for each month of the year. Fifth is Sailing Directions and Pilot Books. This publication offers detailed information on coasts, ports, anchorages, pilotage procedures, and local regulations. Sixth is Light Lists. This publication lists all lighthouses, lightships, and major buoys, including their characteristics, ranges, and positions. Seventh, Tide Tables. These provide predicted times and heights of high and low tides at standard and secondary ports. 8. Tidal Stream Atlases. This shows the direction and rate of tidal streams at hourly intervals over a given area. 9. Notices to Mariners. Weekly or periodic updates issued by hydrographic offices to correct charts and publications to the latest information. 10. Routing Information contains details about traffic separation schemes, deep water routes, and other mandatory or recommended routing systems. Next, radio signal information, including VTS and pilot services. Lists maritime radio services, such as vessels traffic services stations, pilot boarding frequencies, weather broadcasts, and distress communication details. Next, climatic information provides long-term data on wind visibility, fog, temperature, and sea conditions to support safe route planning. Next, load line chart indicates zones and seasonal areas affecting the vessel's permitted draft and load line marks. Next, 
distance tables provide distances between major ports and waypoints useful for voyage estimation and fuel planning. Next, electronic navigational systems information includes data on GPS, ECDIS, AIS, and other electronic systems used for position fixing and route monitoring. Next, radio and local navigational warnings. Broadcasts issued to warn mariners of temporary hazards, such as drifting objects, military exercises, or navigation light failures. Next, draught of vessel. The ship's draft affects route selection, under keel clearance, and tidal considerations along the passage. Next, navigational terms. Ensures consistency and understanding of symbols, abbreviations, in terminology used in charts and publications. Owners and other unpublished sources. These are supplementary information from the vessel's owner, charterers, agents, and port authority. Personal experience. It's about the navigator's own knowledge or prior experience in the area, which adds valuable practical insight. The Mariner's Handbook, a reference manual containing general information about navigation, chart usage, tides, currents, and meteorology. Guide to Port Entry, provides detailed port information including pilot boarding positions, depths, berthing facilities, and local regulations. Nautical Almanac, necessary for determining times of sunset and sunrise, and assists in position fixing when electronic system fails. Additional information not listed in the Bridge Team Management Manual includes the Emission Control Area and High Risk Area. Emission Control Areas are specific sea regions established by the IMO where stricter environmental regulations are applied to minimize air pollution from ships. Within these zones, vessels are required to use low sulfur fuel or other clean energy alternatives to reduce harmful emissions, such as sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, and particulate matter. High-risk areas, on the other hand, are sea regions identified as having a high threat of piracy or armed robbery against ships. These areas are designated by international maritime bodies, such as the IMO and BIMCO, and are often located around regions like the Gulf of Aden, the Arabian Sea, and parts of the West African coast. It may seem that these sources of information are quite extensive, but remember that most vessels today are equipped with digital nautical publications and electronic navigational charts. These tools make it much easier for mariners to access and compile the necessary information efficiently. I'll be creating a separate video in the future that will explain in detail how to gather and organize these sources of information based on the voyage instructions provided by the charterer. Now, if all the necessary information has been collected and appraised, the next step is the planning stage, where the actual voyage plan begins to take shape. In this stage, the navigator uses the gathered data to lay down the ship's intended track on the chart, ensuring that the route is safe, efficient, and compliant with all navigational requirements and company procedures. Once all navigational charts are gathered and arranged in the correct order, they must be carefully examined and no-go areas should be highlighted or crosshatched. Before marking the tracks, margins of safety must be determined to establish safe water. Ocean and open water tracks can be drawn first on a small-scale chart according to the decisions made during the appraisal stage. Any chart change should be clearly indicated, showing the number of the next chart to be used. When navigating close to danger, track consideration must be applied, ensuring that minimum safety rules are followed to keep the vessel within safe water and that a proper distance off danger is maintained. Regulations concerning offshore distances must also be observed. If there is any deviation from tracks, the ship must still remain within safe waters. Under keel clearance should be taken into account when operating in areas of limited depth.
The title window must be checked to confirm that the required UKC is attainable. If not, the area should be marked as a no-go area, and title streams should also be considered. Several other factors must be included when laying tracks and appropriately marked on the charts. These include course alteration and wheel over point, parallel indexing, waypoints, abort point and point of no return, contingency anchorage, position fixing, primary and secondary position fixing, fix frequency, radar conspicuous objects and visual navigational aids, landfall lights, radar targets, buoys, reporting points, anchor clearance, pilot boarding area, traffic areas, transit or ranges, leading lines, clearing marks, head mark, clearing bearings, range of lights, and parallel indexing among others. To explain this in greater detail, I will be creating a separate video in the future that focuses solely on the planning stage based on the voyage instructions provided by the charter. Once the planning stage has been completed, with all charts prepared, tracks laid, and safety margins clearly defined, the next step is the execution stage. Execution stage begins once the plan has been fully prepared, checked, and approved. This stage involves putting a plan into action, ensuring that every element of the voyage is carried out safely and efficiently according to the established procedures. During execution, the bridge team must implement the tactics and timings decided in the planning stage, such as the expected times of arrival for tides and daylight, tidal stream information, traffic conditions, and destination ETA. The plan may be adjusted as needed to reflect real-time conditions like weather, current, or traffic, but any modification should still ensure that the ship remains within safe water and complies with company and international regulations. Before departure, a bridge team briefing must be conducted. This is an essential step to ensure that every team member understands the passage plan and their individual responsibilities. Now, monitoring stage is the final and continuous phase of passage planning. Monitoring involves ensuring that the ship is following the predetermined passage plan and remains within safe waters at all times. It is the primary responsibility of the officer of the watch to verify that the ship's progress aligns with the planned route, making timely adjustments whenever necessary to maintain safety and efficiency. Effective monitoring consists of performing a series of navigational checks, analyzing the results, and taking appropriate action based on that analysis. This includes the use of fixing methods, maintaining regularity in position fixing, verifying estimated positions, taking visual bearings and soundings, and monitoring cross-track error. Other important factors, such as compliance with the international regulations for the prevention of collision at sea, managing non-navigational emergencies, ensuring proper time management, maintaining an effective lookout, monitoring undergeel clearance, verifying waypoints, and checking GPS fixes must also be continuously observed. Through effective monitoring, the navigator ensures that the vessel safely follows the intended passage while promptly responding to any deviations or unexpected conditions. That's all for now. I hope you found this video helpful. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye.